Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. Previously in the series on analog circuits for music synthesis, we've seen how to create voltage controlled oscillators that generate sawtooth waveforms. A little bit later, we'll see how to make oscillators that natively create triangle waveforms. But in the meantime, we'll take a look at how to transform sawtooth waveforms into triangle waveforms. Along the way, I would like to introduce you to a couple of well-known figures in the synthesizer DIY community, namely Ray Wilson and Gene Stopp. So what we're going to do here shouldn't seem terribly surprising. We've already seen how to develop a sawtooth waveform and shift it so that it's centered around DC. And essentially, to get a triangle wave out of this, what we're going to do is we're going to take the negative going part of the wave and flip it upside down. So the positive going part of the signal stays going positive, but the negative part gets flipped. And basically what we're doing here is we're full wave rectifying the signal, aka taking its absolute value. So this will give us a triangle wave, but it's not centered at DC as we would like. So the final stage will be just to take this triangle wave and then scale it and shift it to try to get something that's centered around DC. And I'm not doing a very good job drawing this, but hopefully you get the idea. Ray Wilson was a giant in the synthesizer do-it-yourself community. He sadly passed away four years ago. Many builders have gotten their start putting together modules featuring his printed circuit boards. He's also the author of the only textbook on synthesizer circuits that I'm aware of that has come out in the past three decades. A little over 10 years ago, I supervised a senior design project where the students built a digitally controlled analog synthesizer, and Ray's PCBs served as the basis for the analog design. Nowadays, you can buy Ray's PCB designs from the company SynthCube, and this is a great entry point for anyone who's just getting started, as well as people who have been building modules for a while and want to expand their system. So Ray published many different revisions of his VCO design over the years. I'm using one of his older designs here, not because I think it's better than any of his newer designs, but because the particular way he happened to draw the schematic in this particular section of the circuit is a little easier to visualize in terms of what's going on than some of the newer versions, just in terms of how he drew the schematic. Here we see that we have a sawtooth wave coming in, and we wind up creating two versions of it. There's the original version of the sawtooth wave. Let's say it looks something like that. And then we go through this inverting op amp with the two resistances being the same. So we wind up with an inverted version of that waveform. And then those are shoved into a couple of diodes. Now. The circuit we have here is not what they would call a precision rectifier. That kind of circuit has the diodes in the feedback loop of an op amp. But here they're just sort of hanging out. And essentially what happens is that we have one of the waveforms. Let's say it's this upward going sawtooth wave. And actually, I haven't looked at the rest of the circuit lately, so I don't know I don't actually know which one is going up and which one is going down. It doesn't really matter as long as they're going the opposite direction. And let me draw the other one here. Even if it's hard to figure out what the colors is, you can, you can see the overall pattern here. So essentially what happens here, roughly speaking, is that at this particular point, the diodes are going to compare the voltages that they have. If the voltage for the pink is higher at a particular point, that's the one that's going to survive. Whereas if the orange voltage is higher, this downward going slope, that's the one that's going to survive. Now, what I've drawn here is an approximation. Of course, each of these diodes has a quote-unquote diode drop of somewhere between 0.6 and 0.7 volts. But this is close enough for rock and roll. And then the voltage that we have here flows through this 10K resistor and then through this 20K. So this op amp here is giving it a gain factor of two. And we also have a voltage offset here needed in order to trim this probably to get a nice triangle wave centered around DC. 
And here we have a one kilo ohm output impedance, just in case somebody ties two outputs together or accidentally shorts this to ground with their patch cable or whatever. The rest of the circuitry here takes that triangle wave and produces a sine wave in case the musician wants that. We'll deal with that in a later lecture. You may be wondering about this 10K resistor down to the negative 12 rail. This is a tiny little bias current thrown in to make sure that at least one of the diodes is always on and that they don't shut entirely off. So you don't get some kind of crossover distortion. Now remember that these sawtooth waves are being generated themselves by an imperfect mechanism that has a finite reset time that slightly distorts the waveform and that little glitch here is going to result in some glitches in your triangle waveform. And that's what the circuitry here is designed to deal with. It's basically a little bit of a filtering effect to try to compensate for that glitch. And I'm also wondering what this 22 picofarad capacitor is doing. Let's compute the cutoff frequency associated with that. Let's see. So I have 1 divided by 2 pi times 22 e minus 12 times 20 E3, and that gives me 361 <laughs> kilohertz. Okay, so this capacitor here is for stability, and it's not trying to have a musical effect. I'd also like to introduce you to Gene Stopp, who lately has been an engineer for Moog Music, in particular working on their large historical modular systems. Concerning our interest in this lecture, Gene is the designer of the ASM2, which perhaps unsurprisingly is a revision of the popular ASM1, itself based on some circuits made popular by Electronotes. And I should give you an update because I mentioned Electronotes in a previous lecture, which is that Bernie Hutchins, who is the founder and proprietor of Electronotes, has this note on his website saying, do not send orders funds until further notice. Notice the date here is February 16, 2020. It's over a year later. I'm not going to question Bernie's desire and reasons for wanting to get out of the business here, but let's respect those and not spam him with email. Also, try to avoid emailing people you know that do have a paper Electronotes collection and asking them to scan pages and send them to you because part of your agreement of buying these pages from Bernie is that you won't do that. Anyway, fortunately, if we click on Start Here and scroll down a little bit, you'll find this free online item section, and there is a whole lot of old-school website design here. But the important point that I want to make is that there are a bunch of Electronotes articles that Bernie does provide scans for. So if you wanted something like, oh, if you wanted the filter bank, here's a bunch of stuff, I guess, about filter banks. And let's see, oh, through zero VCO. Yep, here's a bunch of stuff. So if you go to this webpage here, just the information here alone. Wow, there's actually a lot here. This is really fantastic. Okay, this is going to keep you incredibly What's a Kautz function? Ah, yes, I am not familiar with Kautz functions. I would like to investigate Kautz functions. What are these? Uh, they've got some Z transform stuff going on. Okay, anyway, this should keep you very busy. Normally, I wouldn't suggest a board so big as a beginner's project, but one nice thing about this is that the individual sections of the circuit are pretty cleanly partitioned. So you can build one part of the circuit, hook it up, get used from it, build another part later, and you can test the individual sections independently. But you know what? That's a lot of trim pots. So I probably would not recommend this PCB for a beginner. But if you were a beginner who wanted to tackle a large PCB, this would be the large PCB that I would recommend. So you can buy the PCB from Lori Bedoff's company, LB Designs, or you can actually order an entire kit. LB Designs will also provide a nice looking front panel, although of course part of the fun is potentially spinning your own front panel. So let's dig into the schematics a bit. In particular, let's scroll down, 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 
down, down, down, down, down, down, down. Wow, there's a lot of schematics. It's a big, complicated circuit. Ah, notice they've labeled this current controlled oscillator to be truthful about what these things typically really are. Let's see. Ah, here's what I was looking for, the wave shaper. So let's contrast this to what we saw in the Ray Wilson design. Here, you'll see that the device that's turning the sawtooth wave into a triangle wave has the diodes in the feedback loop of the op amp. So if you look around on the interwebs and you Google precision rectifier, this is the circuit that comes up. As usual, these things have trim hots here and there to try to set everything properly. Analog is fun that way. And having the diodes in the feedback loop is very different from having the diodes just sitting outside of the op amp feedback loops in this feed forward mode like we saw in the Ray Wilson design. Now, which design is better in this particular application? I don't really know. And even after surveying a bunch of VCO designs, I can't really give you a good solid reading on which design is more popular. I think the design we saw in the Ray Wilson circuit may be a little more common, largely because that design itself is based on the design from Hal Chamberlain's book, which was based on a design in Electronotes that a lot of aficionados of synthesizer design saw.